Good. A very good morning to everyone uh, gathered here. Some people coming in said it was the first time in the Institute for three years. So for those who are back for the first time, uh, a particular welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody joining in online, the new hybrid world. And I suppose welcome to people who are going to watch this on our uh, YouTube channel and various other channels. Uh, that is that the future has truly arrived. So th this morning we have a uh, two sort of uh, elements to, to the discussion. Later on, we will have the launch of the always fascinating OECD country report. We will have representatives of the OECD, and of course, we'll have uh, Minister and President of the Eurogroup joining us shortly, uh, and he will be giving a, a discussion on that. But before that, we are going to hear from the senior official in the Department of Finance who dealt with the Commission on Taxation. He's going to give a presentation on the Commission on Taxation report, and we're going to have a discussion with the panelists here and yourselves and online uh, questions and contributions as well. So without further ado, uh, let me um, hand over to Dr. Colin McCarthy from the Department of Finance. Sorry, Dr. Colin O'Reardon, Dr. Colin McCarthy. I'm getting my names mixed up. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Thanks. Um, well, obviously, we've reached that time of year where really, um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, and thanks for the thanks for the invitation, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about the Commission on Taxation and Welfare. Um, just to, we're going to. If those of you who have may see have seen the report of the Commission on Taxation and Welfare will know that it is not a short document. It's five hundred and something pages, one hundred and sixteen recommendations. So, in the short time I have this morning, I'm going to uh, give a very, very high level overview of 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 the document and and what it says and what it says about the future of taxation and welfare in Ireland. Uh, and that is by way of encouraging you to. Um, to dip in, we did go to some effort to uh, construct the report in a somewhat modular manner. So you can dip into it and look at the pieces that interest you. And then after Christmas, obviously read the whole thing. So um, maybe we're just gonna, I'm gonna, so, so I'm gonna clip through this fairly, fairly rapidly to give you a sense of, what's, what, of what the exercise was and what's in the report and just to tee up a discussion. Um, the, the terms of reference for the commission, very extensive, um, but we continue to come back to this particular component of it, which for the commission members was the essence of the exercise, which was that the commission was asked to uh, consider how best the tax and welfare systems can support economic activity, promote increased employment and prosperity while ensuring that there are sufficient resources available to meet the cost of public services and supports in the medium and longer term. And I think that's particularly relevant. So there was, as uh, a very wide ranging terms of reference, but this was the, the kernel of the exercise. So <clears throat> moving on to the next slide, why do a commission? Um, what kind of an exercise is a commission? And uh, commissions are uh, uh, very much a product of a 19th century world. They were, uh, there were hundreds of commissions between 1830 and 1900, um, and they were very much the mainstream way of doing policy making before the central state was invented and before we had a civil service and civil service departments on the scale and nature that we currently have. So whereas this afternoon, or sorry, in the second part of our conference this morning, we're going to talk about the merits of a, an external perspective or a peer review from outside, this is an external perspective or, or a peer review from people who are outside, sitting outside of the formal civil service governmental system people with wisdom, knowledge, and expertise who take time out to have a look at a, at a set of issues and to take a, a, a strategic perspective. And very much, if you move the next, to move on to the next slide, this is very much a strategic exercise. So it's not a line by line review of, of the tax and welfare code. It's very much trying to take a stand back view, take a long, uh, medium and longer term view, and to ask very basic questions about what do you want from a tax and welfare system? Starting with, where do you think the country is going? What do you want to achieve? And what role does the tax and welfare system have in the achievement of those big objectives, those big social and economic objectives that the government um, assigned to the commission to consider? 
And again, strategy or the term strategy involves choice. So the commission had choices to make about what it looked at, the level of detail that it looked at them in, and the level of detail in, uh, in, with which it presented its findings. So again, uh, you'll see this as very much a, a long-term overview type of exercise rather than a detailed um, analysis of individual components of the system. That's the role or the, the perspective the commission took. That's the role it saw for itself. Um, moving on to the uh, next slide. I mean, when you do this kind of exercise, obviously you think about how do we think about the future? How do we think about the next um, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how you define medium and longer term. And obviously when you do that, you think about the big factors that every other country thinks about in terms of strategic foresight. And we had some very useful input from our colleagues in the OECD in thinking about what the big trends are. Um, but in some ways, the most compelling uh, data that the commission looked at is data about the Irish story over the last 30 years. And it's an arbitrary period to pick, but, but if you look at the, the, what has happened in Ireland, both quantitatively and qualitatively over the last three decades, then it's quite a, a radical or quite a dramatic story um, that, that, that you see. So <clears throat> Ireland has experienced very rapid economic growth since the late 80s. <clears throat> um, if you look at employment growth and compare Irish employment growth to other uh, OECD countries, the story is even more favorable. Essentially, we're twice as rich and have twice as many people employed as we used to have. And we have done that while at the same time somewhat booking the trend towards greater income inequality. So Ireland is somewhat more equal than it was um, 30 years ago. And we've gone from being the poorest of the rich and being one of the more, high, more highly unequal countries in the OECD to being a much uh, richer place with a much higher level of employment and being much more mid-table um, as far as income distribution is concerned. We might flick on to the next chart. <clears throat> oh dear, we lost. Oh no, we can just about see. Um, uh, why, why is that? Uh, one, I mean, one of the outstanding features of the Irish <clears throat> economy is a very high level of uh, market income inequality. So the distribution of market incomes in Ireland is very uh, unequal compared to other OECD countries but we're about mid-table when it comes to the distribution of disposable incomes. And the reason for that is largely because we have a very highly progressive tax system, which uh, works, if you want to use that expression, very hard or achieves a very high level of redistribution of incomes um, such that disposable incomes are much more equally distributed than, than market incomes. And that's a fairly <coughs> important fact, which leads you to a whole series of of questions about how long that can be sustained into the future or what um, you know what the sustainability of that of that particular structure is. And so what I think the commission uh, was left with was in many ways, um, there are of course difficulties and issues and problems in the tax and welfare system. But this story is really one of um, quite a positive story. It's one of quite a lot of success. There are, of course, deep problems. There's a lot to be done. There's more work to do in terms of income distribution, as far as the Commission saw. Certainly, there are huge challenges in the carbon area. But on the other hand, the question arises as well, what has been at the source of the, what has been, you know, in what sense has the tax and welfare system contributed to this success? And not to put too bluntly, not to put it too bluntly, how do you keep that going or how do you not mess that up? So if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> um, the issue which, which I think sort of became most um, fundamental for the commission was, was essentially this issue of fiscal sustainability. So again, I, time is short, so I won't go into this in, in any great detail, but I think it's important to recognize that this quite um, positive growth story that, has, that we've seen over the last three decades took place during a reasonably favorable demographic window and that demographic window is closing. And so um, <clears throat> we know that due to the quite rapid aging of our population, 
uh, age-related expenditure is likely to increase quite dramatically in the course of this decade, such that between 2019 and 2030, uh, our, my own department estimates, we'll see around 3% of national income uh, in terms of a, an expenditure challenge directly related to income. And we know that there are other issues, particularly in terms of climate, where, <coughs> excuse me, if we, if we achieve what we as a country say we want to achieve, in terms of um, reducing uh, carbon emissions, we will necessarily uh, see a reduction in revenues from uh, fossil fuels, which will have to be in some way replaced. And we also know everybody I'm sure in this room understands that there is a growing concentration risk in our public finances associated with corporation tax receipts. And that's also an issue which has to be understood in terms of a fiscal sustainability challenge. Just flicking on to the next slide, it's worth emphasizing the point, possibly not entirely clearly, but you can see our, our demographic tree as it currently is, and you can see what it looked like in 2040. So there's a very significant and very rapid aging in the population, um, which is partly a result of good news that we're all living longer, but partly a result of um, migration flows which took place shifts in migration flows, which took place in the 50s and 60s and which have altered our, our, our population structure. Um, moving on then to uh, uh, the sort of moving into the recommendations, I won't detain you here. The commission adopted five principles, adequacy, efficiency, sustainability, equity, and reciprocity. Uh, I think if we were to jump into any one of those this morning, we'd be here a very long time, but, but some of these will be familiar for, to you. There are a combination of principles which are well known and well established and go back to Adam Smith um, on the tax side, but also draw on uh, well known and established principles in welfare. And so in some ways, the challenge was merging those two and getting people who um, came from a, shall we say, from a very tax perspective, and those from a very, whose, whose experience was more in the welfare world, understand how those two sets of principles merge. And again, that's set out in the report. In terms of recommendations, it's only <clears throat> um, the core recommendations where that in the view of the commission, their most likely scenario was that Ireland would have to achieve um, a higher, or would have to collect a higher share of, of its national income in taxation and social insurance contributions into the future. And that it's necessary to plan for that and to achieve that at the lowest economic, social, and environmental cost possible. So collecting taxes is inherently imposes costs on economy and society. And it, if in the view of the commission, it is inevitable that a higher share of national income would have to be collected in taxation, how do you do that at the lowest possible cost? And that requires a number of things. I won't surprise you when we say that that requires a broadening of, of tax bases so as to minimize uh, the increase in tax rates, which is a simple but still compelling argument around tax, tax uh, policy, but also the necessity to achieve a different balance in, uh, across, in, in the types of taxation between taxation on earned income, consumption, and wealth. Clicking on to the next chart then, I just thought, you know, as I said, 116 recommendations. <clears throat> it's impossible in the course of the short time we, I have here this morning to take you through those in any detail, but just to point you towards a sample of some of the types of recommendations which are in the report. So again, um, drawing on this idea of horizontal equity and an old fashioned idea of economic efficiency, the, the report argues that income uh, income is income is income. In should, all in forms of income should, as far as possible, be taxed the same. And therefore, it says that the, the primary factor for determining liability for income tax should be income and not any other factor. Um, and so it makes some recommendations on uh, components of the income tax system, which currently deviate from that particular idea. It argues for a broadening of the uh, PRSI system and a more comprehensive treatment of all forms of income um, for the purpose of PRSI. And it argues for a lower, lower nominal rate of employee PRSI below the existing threshold 
partly for reasons of efficiency and sustainability, but also for the purposes of enhancing a sense of reciprocity within the overall tax system. On VAT, it argues for a broaden of the, the VAT base, largely by limiting the use of lower rates and increasing existing uh, the, the level at which lower rates are currently charged. On the next slide, we then uh, tip into a series of recommendations uh, on wealth. Um, <clears throat> commission set out, uh, spent a fair bit of time talking about the case for uh, a shift in the balance of taxation away from taxation on earned income towards taxation on capital and wealth, including taxation of land. And the commission considered the case for net wealth tax, but in the end decided that it would be better to reform the existing capital taxation uh, structures that we have rather than introducing a new net wealth tax. And so it uh, made a number of recommendations aimed at significantly broadening the base for capital acquisitions tax, imposing a modest charge uh, at a low rate on essentially over de minimis level on all uh, capital acquisitions. So you could think of that as a two rate structure within capital acquisitions tax. The idea that everybody should pay something sort of as, um, as applied in the PRSI uh, reform being applied in the capital acquisitions area and the idea that capital gains tax should apply at death. And I'm not going to try to describe that here this morning because we'd be here a very long time. Um, it argues for uh, a significantly increased yield from local property tax, which the Commission saw as a well-functioning tax and one which people understood and um, which uh, was easy for people to get, a, to get a grip on. But outside of that, argued for a side value tax and all other forms of, uh, of, of all land, which is not currently subject to the, uh, to the, to the residential local property tax. And then on carbon, <clears throat> Commission supported very strongly the government's roadmap on um, uh, in increases in carbon taxation and argued that over time it would be necessary to move in order to replace the excise duties that are currently uh, obtained from petrol and diesel to move away from, from that structure towards a road usage structure and argued that uh, for now it would be important to consider what technology would be appropriate in order to assess and collect that tax. And then I think we've one more slide, yeah, which is just on the welfare side. Here the commission essentially made a decision that what was important in, in the welfare area was to uh, again reform existing structures within welfare rather than any large kind of elaborate uh, fundamental re rethink of the existing welfare system. Um, uh, it did not endorse the idea of a basic income, for example, but it did make a number of recommendations in terms of reforming the existing welfare structure. And those included uh, reform of working age payments to, to essentially allow more flexibility in, uh, in the extent to which people can work while in receipt of a working age payment, um, uh, not to tax, tax child benefit, to introduce a second tier of, of child income support within the, the child benefit structure. And it made a recommendation for um, a more evidence-based system for benchmarking social welfare payments and to set multi-annual targets um, on, the on the back of an evidence-based benchmarking structure for, for welfare payments. So that's the very quick rattle through. Um, I don't know how we did on time there, Dan, but uh, as I said, it's a it's a very um, it's a chunky document. It covers, I think, we've eighteen chapters. We go into quite a bit of detail on a number of things, which probably are for uh, a more my something of a minority taste, such as how to evaluate tax expenditures, which might sound um, less than scintillating, but are actually very fundamental to how a tax system is designed, and built, and managed, and a number of other things around. Um, around structures and uh, how budgets are done and so on and so forth. So simply to recommend it to you uh, for um, for bedtime reading over, over Christmas.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Riordan, for your uh, presentation timekeeping. Uh, before introducing our two panelists or discussants here, uh, let me just say that the, this is a Q&A session in about 35 minutes. Everyone here in the audience is invited to put any thoughts or questions. There will be a roving mic, I think, and you can, uh, if you could identify yourself as well, it would be helpful. For those online, there's also um, uh, the option to put questions and comments via the Q&A function uh, that we have here. So joining us here on the panel are Colin Kelly, the global leader of corporate sustainability at PwC International, he previously held a similar role in the taxation uh, sphere, and Dr. Martina Lawless, who's a research professor at the Economic and Social Research Institute at, uh, here, in, here in Dublin. Uh, Martina, maybe start with you. Uh, Colum sets out that he thinks it's pretty much inevitable that tax burden will rise. Do, do you agree with that or is there any alternative? Um, I think I'd agree with that. And I think that's really the key foundation stone of the Commission on Taxation Welfare's report. It's a very extensive report. It goes into an awful lot of detail, as Colin says, on different elements of the tax and welfare system. But but tease up all really of the subsequent recommendations in the report is the opening section, which looks at the challenges um, for the economy sort of over the longer term. And those obviously are the, the aging of population and the climate transition um, as, as the sort of the two key challenges. Also some of the elements of the risks in our current tax structure in terms of the concentration, um, the, the narrow base in general, and in particular, the concentration in corporate tax. Um, so really all of the, you know, if we want to sustain at least the level of public services that we have now, those are going to cost more in the future. There's perhaps a wider debate then of like, do we want the state to do more? The commission's report doesn't get into ideology on that, but it sort of takes for granted that we want the state to at least provide um, what it's providing at the moment, but that will cost more over time and that needs to be paid for. And then, that leads into all of the subsequent recommendations, I think, on the choices that we need to make as to how to pay for those, those costs going forward. And uh, uh, Colm O'Reardon, if I can just ask you all that inevitability question, you know, in, in areas last week, there was wonderful news about an Alzheimer's drug breakthrough, which could potentially mean uh, that we stay healthier longer in older life. You know, are you absolutely convinced the cost of aging is on a sort of lin linear trajectory? There's no possibility that advances would somehow make it less expensive in pensions with alter enrollment uh it doesn't mean that private provision of pensions will will shift that burden um you know is it as inevitable as as you seem to set out in the report um, yes yeah, so i mean look i mean martina makes a good point it would have been open to the commission to sort of take a neutral view on that and that might have been more in keeping with the sort of tradition that you would see in these kind of public finance type of, of exercises but it was interesting that, uh, certainly interesting to me, that they decided not to do that. And they took a view that there was an inevitability that, as Martina said, to provide the existing level of service, um, you would need to see an increase in, in the tax burden. Uh, to be honest, uh, uh, with, with uh, having spent five years in the Department of Health, uh, looking at, at some of this stuff, uh, to, be, to be perfectly frank, you know, I, I tend to be more pessimistic than optimistic about the cost of, of aging. And and uh, again, it's not because we're all living longer and because there's a, you know, you can make this argument around compression mobility, or which is about extending the cost of care. You know, we're all going to live longer, but we're, we're just going to, the care cost is going to come at the end of our lives, no matter how long we live. But in Ireland, the pace of, um, aging is very rapid and it's you know it's not just i mean in in when you look at pensions you look at ratios you know dependency ratios when you look at uh, healthcare you look at numbers raw numbers of patients landing to into eds and the facilities and the number that have to be provided for them so gotta say i i'd be more pessimistic than optimistic if anybody has any more optimistic views on that, but it's certainly welcome, but I would, uh, would love to hear them. Uh, Colm, Ireland, is, you're very much a global role in your current role now in PwC and, and previously specialising in the tax area. Um, Ireland is one of the most globalised economies in the world. It's become as successful in many ways as, as, as Colm pointed out, because it has tapped in, hitched its wagon so successfully to, to globalisation. Do you feel the, the report was sufficiently... Um, 
cognizant of the need to remain competitive in a globalized world. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually, I think it was um, partly for the reasons that both Martina and Colm have re-emphasized, uh, which is that the report puts on the table what I would describe as the inevitable realities that have to be dealt with, demographics and climate change being two, and, and I think there are probably others we can we can elaborate on, which means that in order to sustain the system which is competitive, efficient, effective, impactful from a business perspective, those realities have to be dealt with. And I think what the commission did an outstanding job on is putting options on the table, which can be considered as potential responses to these kinds of issues. I think what's critically important though, is that having put them on the table, it uh, I hope ensures that we don't end up in a debate about the pros and cons of individual specific items based on a, a winners and losers type conversation, because that will detract from the inevitable reality that we may not like elements of this, but this thing has to be dealt with. We have to deal with the demographic challenge. We have to deal with climate change in terms of both decarbonization, but also climate change as, as, a, as a deteriorating reality, right? the risks which are already beginning to unfold. And so I think that the context within which the Commission deals with those issues is well put. I would only add that the role of the Commission was specifically to look at tax and welfare within the current construct that we have. I would say that the reality is that there are profound changes underway in the global economic system as well. Um, and uh, I was thinking this morning, if you make a list of issues which are probably on the top of the agenda for most businesses at the moment, uh, inflation, high inflation, high interest rates, an energy crisis, war in Europe, and the fallout from the pandemic, not one of those issues uh, would have been alive three years ago, not, not one. And at the same time, we have profound structural changes in the global economic system uh, related to climate and the transition. Ongoing rolling technology will continue to be more pervasive and disruptive. The demographic changes we face, they are profoundly significant in many other regions. And last but not least, the geopolitical environment within which business make decisions is completely different to where we would have been three to five years ago. Those factors will endure for decades and they will have material influence on the way in which businesses make decisions. That will impact the shape of Ireland's economy. It will create tremendous opportunities, but it will reset the context within which our tax and welfare systems operate as well. And just on the positive aspect there, you mentioned the opportunities. Very often we're sort of looking at the, the challenges and the risks. Um, where are those opportunities? Well, I think they will be in the evolution of both uh, sectors and also in the role which countries like Ireland uh, can and will play. So, for example, if you take the geopolitical fracturing and um, an increasing emphasis in some of our big partners on near shoring or French shoring, uh, anchored in the EU and closely connected with the US, we're probably as well positioned as ever to support that business dynamic between those two regions. Um, I think in terms of sectors, uh, there's no question that the concentration risk that we see, for example, in, te in tech, well, well, that's a function of great success. And it's inevitable that that will have a, a disruptive period, let's say, but it too will refresh itself. New businesses will come on stream, new technologies, new players, and the energy transition will also drive transformation through most sectors. So all of those, and they're just examples, all of those factors will create new players in newly emerging sectors doing new things to try and access new markets with new operating models. For Ireland, the trick is to refresh the way in which we have participated in those activities in that new economic environment for the next generation. The column described very well how successful we have been doing that for the last 25 to 30, to 30 years. Good. Uh, Martina, I often confuse your institute and the social insurance, you know, so here inside, as many people have done, but maybe come, come to you on, on that in, in a moment. But again, just to emphasize, we very much want to have a, an open discussion here. So if people in the room or people online want to make a point or contribute, uh, they're very welcome and just indicate uh, to me if you want to, to want to come in. Um, on the specific recommendations there on lowering PRSI, ERSI, PRSI, um, um, what are your thoughts on that? And generally, a lot of talk in recent times of making the 
uh, social insurance system more like continental European systems where uh, what you get out more closely aligns to what you get in. Thoughts on, 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 on that? Well, on, on, on a first broad thought, I thought it was really useful that this particular commission was a commission on taxation and welfare, which I don't think we've ever had before. Um, all the others just looked at the taxation system, but obviously the, the intersection and the, the overlap between the two of them are really important in terms of how they support economic activity and avoid this sort of concept that any, you know, Taxation sort of by definition is introducing some distortion to people's behaviors. Um, so to how to get the, the most revenue with the minimum distortions is sort of the, the magic um, balance that is you know, tried to strike there. Um, on the peer side, I, I think as a sort of, not specifically on any individual tax, but in general, sort of the broadening and, and simplification of the tax system is probably the, the most obvious way to bring in more revenue without having any kind of dramatic changes to the tax to the tax system. And I think a lot of the commission's report, it did start from, you know, we are where we are on the tax and welfare system and introducing very sweeping changes always runs the risk that of sort of unintended consequences. So lots of the, the recommendations are kind of gradual expansions and extensions of the current system. And so the PRSI recommendation to cover all income and get rid of some of the exemptions to that is an example of you know a way to broaden the tax base without doing anything sort of particularly radical that might have kind of unexpected consequences on on people's behavior colin when you when you spoke to us um about a year and a half ago uh, at the institute you, you use the word path dependency a lot um this is a, a term wonks use for really you, you, low direction or travel is more or less set and it's hard to do something of what Tina picked up there on, you know, lack of radicalism. Are, 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 you, um, are you a sort of orthodoxy type or would you be more like a recent British Prime Minister? Um, be more radical? I, I mean, so first of all, I am a mere servant of the Commission, Dan. Um, so I'm, I'm simply interpreting what, what these very fine people might have thought. I do think... Um, how, how would I put this? I, I do think you have to be realistic about what I would call administrative capacity and, and bandwidth. Okay, so one of the things the Commission says in the report is that you think about what the social welfare system does every week. While we're sitting here, it's delivering millions of payments every week. It's a complex system. It needs big IT. It needs uh, a legislative underpinning. It needs it has some non-legislatively um, based schemes. It has to be run on a basis of probity and all those. So it's a big, complicated system. And therefore, it's important to ask yourself the question, what can, be, what can realistically be done? Okay. And so I think what one of the things that's reflected in the Commission report is, let, let, let's see what we can do pragmatically with what we have. And um, there are, you know, I mean, even to introduce the second tier child benefits is, um, uh, uh, payment, which is a recommendation that has been around in policy discussions in Ireland for a long time. That would be a big project for my colleagues in the Department of Social Protection to deliver. Um, they, you know, they refer to it and it's, if you look at their submission to the Commission on Tax and Welfare, it suggests that that's something they're interested in doing. So I think you have to ask yourself what's deliverable in terms of and, and of what the policy bandwidth is and what the administrative bandwidth is. And equally, you can see that, I think that's a fair comment. You can see that in terms of say, the decision to say, mm, net wealth tax, not so sure. Let's look at what we have and develop what we have. And I think that's, I think that's important. So you can see that at that level. And then in terms of the very big, issues of you know how does Ireland sit as a welfare state versus you know a German welfare state or a UK welfare state or so on and so forth I don't think those things change overnight those things evolve that's probably what uh, is, is. so you can see it at the micro and at the micro. Good uh, let's start with a few questions Francis. I'd just like to follow up on what Colm has just been talking about because in a way uh, you're doing a very undersell I think in relation to what was achieved, because I think by starting with the guiding principles as you did, you allowed yourself to think how incrementally you can move the system towards delivering better on the objectives of what we're trying to do across the tax and welfare area. 
And when I think about it, in a lot of cases when um, um, reports like this are, 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 are come out, people focus on what's the new big thing. Now, we saw a lot of the new big thing in the UK in October, and <laughs> we saw what happened. But actually, I think there's a huge benefit in what you've done in, in, in making it clear what you're seeking to achieve across the tax and welfare bases. I think that was really, really important. And I think what it gives is a metric and a reference point for further changes that might come up in very practical ways. So I, to me, sort of this concept of strategic incrementalism is really about knowing where you're heading and not about the brand new thing that will try to tick six of those boxes in one go and may or may not move or may or may not be practical when it comes to it. So I think what you've actually put in place is, is pretty good. I'd like to go back to the, um, uh, just very briefly then, to the issue on health and your, your pessimism. So I just the one thing I would say in relation to that, I think if our policies on aging and our practices with relation to aging becomes more positive. In other words, our self um, uh, taking care of is something to think of it just in terms of health. And I'm afraid you're, you're suffering from having been in Baggett Street because you think of A&E mm -hmm. numbers immediately you jump to. To me, health is about care in the community and a continuum, et cetera. So I just think that there's, there's you know, I think we need to be proactive about the other matters that will actually help us to put in place a, uh, a framework for better, better ma management of, of, of aging, you know, including the, the, the retrofitting of houses so that people actually don't suffer from hypothermia are less likely to get, to get, to get serious illnesses. So that's the, just one thing I would say to you. I think, I think you know, paralleling what you're saying is to me a look at, 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 at positive sides of, uh, to, of policy interventions that will help that. Uh, do you want to respond or can I go? No, no, go on. I mean, I, I, mean, I absolutely agree with that. Point. Good. Our other column here, right beside me, just in your specialization area now on sustainability, in the report, in terms of the funding of the transition to net zero, how do you evaluate what the report sets out? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. It, it uh, en endorses the existing plans, increasing carbon taxes in order to drive the decarbonization process. Um, and at face value, that's entirely appropriate, entirely logical. I think in the middle of an energy crisis with ever increasing inflation, the capacity to absorb a layer of carbon taxes being imposed is a real challenge. And it's not just a political challenge, it's a real social challenge, a real economic challenge. And, and I think um, part of the decision that will need to be taken, and, and I agree with what Francis said, actually, you're back to this, this strategic incrementalism, part of the way in which we will have to navigate this path step by step over the coming 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years will reflect those kinds of uh, external factors, if you like, which influence the specific nature of what you can do and when. But they will be bounded by a reality. We're not going to negotiate with Mother Nature. Uh, this thing continues to deteriorate. And I think one of the factors that's underestimated um, is that even getting to net zero, which keeps us within 1.5 degrees uh, Paris aligned by 2050, that of itself brings very material deterioration in climate physical hazards. That's not widely appreciated. And we're miles off track for 1.5. So we can expect to continue to see worsening climate issues as we saw last summer in Europe, wildfires, drought, heat. That will continue to deteriorate from now in the current business cycle, in the current political cycle and, and beyond. So the pressure to continue to do two things in parallel, one, to decarbonize and two, to prepare for these deteriorating events will continue to build. I think one of, the, one of the interesting global dimensions which is now coming into play in the carbon tax conversation is the differing economic approaches being taken, quite profoundly differing uh, approaches being adopted in different regions. So Europe very focused on carbon taxes. I think we had the carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM, approved yesterday, I think I saw in the papers. Um, uh, and in the US, uh, really surrendering on carbon taxes and shifting to uh, incentives through the rather unfortunately named uh, IRA, uh, which we all find very difficult to talk about positively. Um, but it has profound significance for accelerating the decarbonization process in the, in the US. And as we've immediately seen, it has a knock-on effect then from a competitive perspective between the US and, and the EU. So I, th I think... Again, to re-emphasize this point that, that I think everybody's made, 
this is an inevitable reality, it has, has to be dealt with. The Commission has done us a huge service. I agree with Francis, I think Colm had no choice but to be very modest on behalf of himself and his colleagues. I think they've done an outstanding piece of work putting these issues on the table, these inevitable realities, and giving us a series of options in relation to which we can then respond. But they have to be dealt with. And so I think the challenge in Ireland will be to find the balance between navigating those different paths over that period of time, but, but with a clock which will continue to tick. Okay. I just I thought it was interesting conversation we had earlier on in terms of you see the deterioration of catastrophic events as already baked in. They're not a risk. The risk is they could get even worse. No. Uh, Dermot. Uh, thanks, uh, Derms O'Leary from Good Buddies. I want to come back to the issue of the role that the taxation system has in the success of our economic model, um, and and to the extent that you you know you can argue that it's inevitable that these aging issues or climate change issues will bring um, an increased need for for tax resources, but you could also argue that by increasing taxation, that will actually disrupt the economic model that brought those resources in the first place. So my question really to Colin, really, how much consideration and benchmarking, well, first, first of all, how much consideration was was given to, to, to the role that that incentivization on the tax side has played in, in the success that you talked about? Um, and in terms of, you know, benchmarking for the future, in terms of what impact changes may have on that model in the future. The question. I mean, I, I, I think the report um, is reasonably clear that the Commission is very seized of the role that taxation particularly has played over the last 30 years in, in the transformation that, that has taken place. Now, to an extent, um, does that mean that if we made any change at all in, in our, in, let's say, in our aggregate taxation policy that all of a sudden that that success would evaporate i don't think it would i think um i think there's reasonably strong evidence to suggest um that it's a little bit more robust than that but i think if you look at the report commission was very focused on the importance of promoting enterprise the importance of promoting employment and uh, maintaining a low stable predictable corporate tax regime uh, very supportive of the government's approach on, on engagement with the BEPS process, um, but because it wants a low, stable, predictable um, corporate, corporate tax regime. The Commission argues that there's more that could be done to promote you know, enterprise and, and, and startups, but also fundamentally important not to go back to some of the things that we've seen before, where the easy thing to do was in, when more money was needed was to sort of hike up taxes on employment and, and income taxes. So I think that kind of discussion is in the report. Um, and there's a sense that we've traveled a long road, we've learned a lot. And I think one of the over sort of sitting and listening to the discussions over 13 months, a very strong sense of, well, we've learned a few things and we've made mistakes in the past and let's not go and do that again. And, and so I think you'll see a fair degree of uh, of understanding of the role that low taxation has played in, in certain areas and the need to, you know, minimize the cost of any increases in the tax burden. I, I was just going to, can I, Martina first, and then we come? Yeah, I think one of the... Uh, Some sort of background to that question as well, just further on that. Do you think it's fair to say that the economics profession is now less keen on carrots and sticks than it used to be? Um, so... I, I, I don't know if economics are less interested in carrots and sticks. I think they're still very interested in using the tools available to incentivize um, sort of preferable activities. The carbon tax is a great example of that, where it's you know, as much a behavioral change in incentive as it is a, a revenue raising tax. Um, and in a lot of ways, one of the complications of the, the recommendations in the, the Tax and Welfare Commission's report um, is that for some, in some cases, you're trying to do multiple different things. The overall objective of the taxation system is to get the revenue to fund public services. But for a lot of taxes, you're also trying to, you know, incentivize certain types of behavior. Obviously, the carbon tax is the, the most obvious one. Um, we're trying to, you know, disincentivize um, particular behavior. And in other cases, you're trying to introduce, you know, revenue raising um, mechanisms 
while minimizing the distortions. And this is where the taxes on, on enterprise um, are probably you know more relevant. You want to get some revenue in, you do need to, to get fund that, but you want to keep the revenue base as wide and broad as possible in order to keep the rates low and to not have the, the tax burden falling disproportionately in any one area in a way that might um, undermine sort of incentives for enterprise and, and, and for work. Um, but it does kind of, you know, the, the commissions and the, the kind of the Irish states kind of objectives in this are really helped by the fact that we're starting from a very solid base of you know, strong economic growth, um, a very good FDI system, you know, high levels of employment. So, you know, the Commission's report and Ireland's kind of trajectory in terms of fiscal sustainability, you know, do need to recognize that it's built on very good foundations. Um, but as Dermot and, and, and Colin said, to avoid some of the risks of the past, and we did see, you know, when the construction sector collapsed in 2008, not only did that cost the state a lot of money, um, but revenues also collapsed because they were so very concentrated in one particular sector. And it's that avoidance of concentration to an idiosyncratic risk in one particular area um, that I think a lot of the recommendations um, about the broadness of the base are trying to avoid. You want to come in? Yeah, I, I, I want to um, I want to contextualize the specific question as well, back to a comment I made earlier, which is that the world is changing so profoundly in so many, the economic environment in so many different dimensions that I think we should acknowledge the significance of the tax question, the, um, the appeal of a competitive corporate tax environment in particular, but the decision criteria which increasingly are being used uh, in order to make investment decisions are, um, I would say, have growing significance attaching to the sustainability of that framework. And I think uh, BEPS and the OECD uh, dynamic is of profound significance there. Um, and uh, added to that, for the reasons I touched on earlier, you have businesses really focused not just on the sustainability of the tax system, but the availability of the necessary skills, the political dynamic, which will influence uh, decisions in relation to investments of particular functions, locations of supply chains and so on. So I think you see a much higher focus now on issues like sustainability and resilience and stability, um, as well as um, an appropriately competitive tax system. That's quite different from where we would have been 20 to 25 years ago. And I think that's really important in the context of positioning, not just our tax strategy, but this is the point I was making earlier, positioning our forward-looking economic strategy for the future, which will be different because of the changes that I've described, and they will have to go hand in hand. Oh. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Colm and, and thanks to the panel. Um, it's an observation and, and, and maybe a question, and it comes back really to the, the narrowness of the base, which I think, Colm, you, you were referring to. And like, if you look at corporate tax receipts, we now have a situation in which one in eight of overall receipts, not just on the corporate tax fund, but one in eight of overall receipts are coming from 10 firms, okay? They're pretty much in the high technology sector. And an example that I sometimes give is if you look at BlackBerry 10 years ago or even Nokia 10 years ago, these were the cutting edge technologies. They're now pretty much redundant. You know, BlackBerry turned off its, its support networks at the beginning of this year. So because the sector is changing so rapidly, is there really a, a risk that, you know, some of the cutting edge technologies that are there now in which Ireland is, is very much exposed will not be there in, let's say, 10 years' time. And that, of course, would, would impact on, on tax revenue and you know uh, re reduce the tax base and so forth. And then on the other side, the, the income tax, we know that a huge proportion of income tax paid is paid by a very small number of, of people. Um, so a question really to the panel is, is it a case that the income tax system is overly progressive at the moment? Uh, that there are no incentives, for instance, to, to take up employment, et cetera, at the lower end of the, uh, of, of, of the spectrum. So just an observation and a question. Maybe we'll go, well, 
Do you want to start on that one? We can always trust one's colleagues to ask the most difficult questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, we um, I threw out my my BlackBerry charger uh, over the weekend, and but we also threw out other chargers as well for other other um, notable companies. So so there's always change, and there's always churn, and there's always uh, there's always that risk. Um, I think uh, I'm right in saying that. Ireland is the only Western European country to have escaped the middle income tra trap in the 20th century. Um, and that's a, so, so, so I think the commission's view was that there's a sort of a permanence to the achievement of becoming an advanced economy, right? So you could have that, you could have, there are risks obviously, and the concentration risks are, as, you, as you've described, John, very, very striking. But on the other hand, there's an enduring capacity in the Irish economy to attract the next wave of technology, the next round. But that takes a lot of work and it takes, you know, colleagues in, in the IDA and, and to, to, to do that, that kind of work. So I don't think we, we underestimate that. Um, so I, th I think there's an enduring um, transformation that has been achieved. And I don't think it's necessarily the case that we could just switch off something and we go back to where we were um but that's not to say that one can be complacent about about policy into the future Martina, do you want to follow up on that one yeah and i also sort of agree john that i think the risks on the corporate tax revenue side are much more in the sort of like the idiosyncratic risks to the fact that it's such a small number of companies i think there's a lot of focus on the challenges of the changes in the, in the global tax system and the bet system but actually what we've seen in ireland is if anything that's increased our corporate tax revenues as, as firms realign themselves with the real activity that is going on in ireland because ireland has sort of a lot of you know these companies doing real substantive business here so i don't see the corporate tax risk being so much in the the global tax system changes as i'd see it as being in the concentration and the exposure that that brings to idiosyncratic risks of you know people you know Twitter getting taken over by somebody who makes strange decisions as to how it's wrong. So there's a lot of the like, concentrating on individual companies is 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 quite a risk there. And there's also an overlap between the concentration. Those companies because they do have real substantive presence here are the companies paying the high wages. So there's a big intersection between the corporate tax concentration and the income tax concentration. And often there's a tendency to talk about the two as completely different things. So I think it's really important to, to kind of see the overlap there. Um, but overall, as, as Colin says, you know, Ireland has now built up a very strong base and reputation um, and a lot of expertise, both in human capital in high technology companies. Um, but there will be sort of churn on that and that the kind of the risks that it brings are kind of are quite real. And that's one of the reasons again to support the maybe slight broadening of the base um, into other areas like wealth taxes uh, and so on as well. Okay, we're, we're just hitting the end of the event. So there's a question here from Anne-Marie McGowan from the National Economic and Social Council. Um, she asks, there's a lot of resistance to changing capital acquisition tax, particularly around inheritance. Do you have any suggestions on how to have discussions or other options to help change the narrative on this? So, Colin, we'll take that to conclude. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's not untypical of what I referred to earlier when we get into a winners versus losers debate on any particular proposed policy change, the um, quality of the debate tends to deteriorate. I think what the Commission work has done is help us contextualize those conversations by asking uh, the question, well, what purpose does the policy uh, achieve? What are we trying to solve for? What is the outcome which we think this will deliver? Which uh, then we can have a debate about the merits of that outcome or not, uh, not just the tax mechanism to achieve that. And I think that will apply actually across the board in, in lots of these kinds of areas. And in the inheritance tax space, for example, uh, one of the issues which goes back to the principles which the Commission used to underpin its work is the question of whether we are comfortable with the degree of inclusion and intergenerational, fa intergenerational fairness that we have in the Irish economy and the Irish society at the moment. That's a conversation that we should have because then tax policy, like inheritance tax, can be used as a mechanism to address, uh, at least in part, some of those concerns. 
the debate that we should be having is the degree to which we want to address those issues and then use tax and other measures as a mechanism to do that. That's the context within which that conversation can take place. Okay, thank you. So we're going to uh, bring this section of, the, of this morning's events to a uh, conclusion. There's coffee and I think some snacks over there. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break and come back at 10.15 for the OECD presentation. So just a final thank you to all our panelists uh, for their important work. Thank you.